It is Friday, February the 26th, 2021. This is the Distant Best Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff and George. On today's show, an introduction to Black Reconstruction. That's Dr. Du Bois to you. Yeah, today I'm going to tell you all about W.E.B. Du Bois. Who he was, what he produced, what he had to say about American democracy, race, economics, and politics. You know, America hasn't actually produced that many great thinkers or academics or really left of liberal. And political philosophy, he was without doubt one of our best. But of course, before I get to all of that, just a brief reminder that this show, like all of these shows, is brought to you by listeners like you. Listeners who have gone to patreon.com slash distant peasant and become recurring donors for as little as one dollar a month. Thank you to each and every one of my patrons, especially during these difficult times for the American economy. Difficult times for a while now. Don't seem to be getting much better. So I very much appreciate the support. I know it's been a while since the last episode. This subject will be broken into multiple episode parts, of course. But if you want to know what I've been up to other than the research for this podcast and my drudgery as a parole in America, I want to remind you to go to twitch.tv slash post post revolution where I am helping put together a little Twitch channel project with two of my boys, Big Bro Bra and the Kentucky Fire Comrade on Twitter. I know funny names. I'm just Jeff. But well, we work well together, and we really appreciate you checking out that show on Saturdays and Sundays, as well as during the week whenever any one of us has time to go live. Again, that's twitch.tv slash postpostrevolution. Give that channel a follow. Please and thank you. Happy Black History Month. I barely made it. On with the show. On August 27th, 1963, human democracy lost one of its greatest champions, one of the greatest champions the United States of America has ever produced in any way. W.E.B. Du Bois was dead in Ghana. He'd always been a divisive man. He was far too bold and clever, far too possessed of an ever-refining wisdom born of both equal parts ruthless intellectualism and the purest humanism he could muster to ever sail through life without trouble, even if he hadn't been born black in a white supremacist nation. His enemies and even a few of his allies had noted that these traits had led him to several places of seeming contradiction over his 95 years on this planet. He was a Marxist who once called Stalin both a tyrant and a simple, calm, courageous man who conquered race prejudice in the Soviet Union. Du Bois was a man who championed both indigenous national liberation and global international communism. He championed both radical racial integration and radical racial separation. He was both an insightful propagandist and an incredibly measured and rigorous scholar. All of us, if we are lucky to exist long enough, learn and change enough as we age to experience some paradoxes about ourselves, we come to cease to believe or disbelieve in this or that. Du Bois held fast to some important truths, though, of course. His principles didn't change so much as his interpretation of what consequences for action those principles produced in the ever-churning dialectical process of forging human society but in doing all this, he made plenty of enemies, or at least made fewer friends than he might have. Roy Wilkins had been no friend to Du Bois, nor to many a socialist or communist. He was executive secretary of the NAACP when news arrived of Du Bois' death on August 28, 1963. Du Bois had been a founding member of that NAACP in 1909. And coincidentally, that was the day of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, most famous for remarks made there by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his commonly named I Have a Dream speech. 
When Bayard Rustin crossed the crowded stage to deliver the news to Wilkins, suggesting he might want to say a few words to the crowd about the death of such an important man to their cause, Wilkins balked. I'm not going to get involved with that communist at this meeting, Wilkins told Rustin. I'm not going to announce that communist's death. Rustin crossed the stage again to confer with A. Philip Randolph, an elder statesman of the labor and civil rights movement, who grumbled back, Tell Roy that if he doesn't announce it, I will. The prospect of giving the old labor leader the opportunity to eulogize a great and famous black socialist intellectual made the liberal Wilkins pause. Rustin, a brilliant and gifted organizer for civil rights whose political beliefs and sexual orientation has cruelly and unfairly suppressed historical appreciation for his importance, was kind enough to the people of the present and us in the future to insist to Wilkins that someone must announce the death of one of the 20th century's most powerful civil rights leaders at this massive demonstration for civil rights, whether Wilkins wanted Randolph to do it or not. So Wilkins relented. Du Bois had always had a habit of being hard to ignore, even in death, it turned out. He was always too eloquent, too radical, too clever, too wise, too rigorously researched, too... Frequently, some magic combination of these and other traits to do so. The liberal Wilkins bent the knee to the dead socialist Du Bois, and he was honored with a moment of silence by the crowd, many of whom had no idea who he was. In his brilliant work, The Souls of Black Folk, recommended by A. Sonny Wilkins. William Edward Burkhart Du Bois it's come up on my show before, a few times. He's always been a bit intimidating as an intellectual. He's incredibly skilled at making himself hard to disagree with. He was a good writer, generally. He was an author of fiction and fact, poetry and prose. But he was also a rigorous and committed scholar in political philosophy, history, and sociology, among other things. I have come to believe that my being so impressed with him has had an adverse effect of encouraging a myopic tendency that's caused me to avoid him as a subject, he is so obviously brilliant to me that surely I must be among the last to appreciate his brilliance. Whether that's true or not, even the fiercest flames need air to burn bright and be recognized, so here is my attempt to pump some air into the furnace, metaphorically speaking. Now, Du Bois lived a long time, produced a huge body of work, and was an expert in many arts and sciences. So a worthy exploration of his entire life and thinking is beyond my real but limited narrative power. But without a doubt, one of his best scholarly works, and one near and dear to students of American history who love justice, is his masterpiece history, Black Reconstruction, or originally, Black Reconstruction in America, an essay towards a history of the part which black folk played in the attempt to reconstruct democracy in America, 1860 to 1880. It's called an essay, yet spans over 700 pages and is therefore rarely read in entirety by anyone. But lucky for both myself and for you, I am one of the rare folk who have. And I am happy to report that, despite first being published way back in 1935, it continues to hold up, being both almost exhaustively informative and yet never boring. So today, we will very briefly explore the life of Du Bois, and you will come to learn why I find him so impressive, and then discover through Black Reconstruction what the pale shadow of a labor-driven socialist revolution looks like, how we once had it in our grasp, how we lost it, and maybe how we might grasp it again. William Edward Burkhart Du Bois was born February 23rd, 1868 to Alfred and Mary Du Bois in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Now, as an aside, his name was and is pronounced like Du Bois based upon his own certain instructions, but his name also has roots in French. So if you thought it was Du Bois, no one can blame you much. His mother was descended from the small, free, black population of the area, who had some land, and his father was descended from the black slaves in Haiti. William's paternal great-grandfather was a French slave master. His father left the family when William was only two, 
leaving him, called Willie by his intimates as a boy, to be raised by his mother, who moved with her son back to her parents' home. She and her family worked to support the two of them until she suffered a stroke sometime early in the 1880s. She died in 1885. 19th century Massachusetts might leave a lot to be desired in terms of racial equality compared to us today, but it was certainly a damn sight better than many other places in the United States. William attended integrated schools and had white playmates, and his teachers recognized his academic abilities early in life. They encouraged these, and this, along with the donated money from his Congregationalist church, gave William the opportunity to attend the historically black Fisk University in Tennessee, 1885 though he wanted to go straight on to Harvard, of course. At Fisk University, this was really his first personal experience with Southern racism, if not racism generally, and he was horrified by it, even if it didn't seem to slow him down much. While teaching there in the summer, Du Bois completed a bachelor's degree at Fisk in 1888. Harvard did not accept any credentials from Fisk, so Du Bois completed a bachelor's degree in history there, graduating cum laude, before receiving a scholarship to attend Harvard's new graduate school in sociology. He received his Ph.D. in 1895, the first black man at Harvard ever to receive a doctorate. He would forever insist on being addressed even by his closest friends as Dr. Du Bois for the rest of his life. He spent some time teaching and researching in Ohio and Pennsylvania beginning in 1894. One important accomplishment of note during this time was a sociological study he produced on the black community in Philadelphia called The Philadelphia Negro, a rigorously statistical and empirically driven work that was the first of its kind in at least two ways. Scholars simply did not study black communities in America at the time and sociology itself as a discipline was in its infancy still struggling to become systematic and scientific. The Philadelphia Negro, in both subject and form, was the first of its kind. In 1897, he moved to Georgia to take a job at Atlanta University, now called Clark Atlanta University, where he was able to publish the previously mentioned sociological study and where he would remain until 1910. His students almost universally described him as strict, aloof, and brilliant. Now, like I said, Dr. Du Bois lived a long time, and he therefore did and experienced a lot of things. But one event that transpired in Atlanta while he was there affected him more than most. In 1899, a black man called Sam Hose killed his employer. Now, it's impossible to know for sure, as no trial was ever held to prove the truth but almost certainly what happened is this. Sam asked for time off to visit his sick mother. His boss pulled a gun on him. Now, Sam was working with an axe at the time. He threw it at his assailant. He killed him, and he fled the scene. Now, this killing, almost certainly an act of self-defense, transformed through rumor into a cold-blooded murder of the boss, the raping of his wife, and the injury of his child, despite the fact that Sam never even tried to enter the house. Georgia's whites were being whipped into a racist frenzy, and Dr. Du Bois was becoming increasingly nervous about the situation. He dashed off a letter expressing the importance of due process and constitutional rights, and was walking to a meeting with the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution when he received the news. Not only had Sam Hose been tortured to death with blade and flame, but his burned knuckles were for sale for 25 cents on the very road on which Du Bois walked. Dr. Du Bois went back home and would come to believe that he could not embrace a professional life that was strictly academic. That, quote, one could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were lynched, murdered, and starved, end quote. He also reflected on the poster's mindset, quote, the cure wasn't simply telling people the truth, it was inducing them to act on the truth, end quote. Around this time, Du Bois started becoming foil to Booker T. Washington. Now, they had real differences of opinion on what black people ought be doing in American society, 
even if the animosity between them was always more driven by their partisans than their personalities. In 1895, Washington gave a speech that Du Bois and history has deemed the Atlanta Compromise. Basically, a plan that black people in America, the vast majority of whom still lived in the rural South, would submit to segregation, discrimination, disenfranchisement, and strictly non-union employment in exchange for basic education, some economic opportunity, justice within the courts, and increased investment by Southern and Northern progressive whites in their communities. Though initially supportive of the speech, Du Bois came to believe that if the bargain was honored, it might be worth accepting, and it never would be. In this I hold with Du Bois, the real barrier that stopped the accumulation of wealth for black America after the Civil War and Reconstruction was not a lack of education or investment in themselves, but in their lack of civil and political rights. It's difficult to build up wealth when your wages are suppressed and the white communities imposed fines and taxes so high and targeted specifically at you. But where these were overcome in our country, and a black middle class did emerge with difficulty, such as in the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a mob of whites might come and steal what they liked while wrecking the rest, and never face any legal punishment. Anyway, in 1905, Du Bois and other civil rights activists formed the Niagara Movement, may our fight for equality be as the rushing waters of the falls and all that, and they opposed what they considered the accommodationism of Booker T. Washington. Now, things were slow for them at first. Most publications aimed at a black audience, and the sympathizers in America were either controlled by or sympathetic to Booker T. Washington's political machine, who in turn deemed their confrontational and provocative methods at the Niagara Movement to be suicidal for black America. They therefore had to found their own magazines and write their own hard-to-publish editorials, but over time... Their efforts and events during this the nadir of race relations in America would lead to a strengthening of their case among civil rights activists. In 1910, attending the Second National Negro Congress, Du Bois and the other attendees created the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Now, if you have ever wondered why it is the organization doesn't use Negro with a capital N or Black or African in its name going instead with the term colored, the reason is Du Bois. Upon his suggestion, they all committed themselves not to the advancement of any one race, but to the advancement of all non-white peoples. Dark-skinned people everywhere, as he put it. The newly formed NAACP offered Dr. Du Bois a position as Director of Publicity and Research, which he accepted in the summer of 1910. Mainly, this meant editing the magazine The Crisis that organization's monthly, which he did much to build into a success. After 10 years, their circulation had reached 100,000 readers. He joined the Socialist Party for a couple years, and while more than sympathetic to workers and supportive in theory of a class-conscious proletariat running society, he was incredibly distrustful of organized labor in the United States. At the time, Nearly every union barred black people, and not a few socialists were campaigning explicitly for white labor. The U.S.'s entry into World War I split the NAACP, as it did many on the left in America at the turn of the 20th century. On the one hand, Du Bois opposed the war as an imperialist adventure, and openly hoped for it to lead to an overthrow of white colonialism in China, India, and America all, but on the other hand, some in the NAACP wanted to use this as an opportunity to push to integrate, say, the Officer Corps of the United States. Dr. Du Bois himself, after publicly taking a principled anti-war stance, abruptly reversed himself in exchange for an officer's commission in the United States Army, which was then promptly withdrawn when Southern officers objected. The end of World War I meant Du Bois could travel the world again, and so it was that during this time he really became involved with the Pan-African movement, and first began to cautiously explore the writings of Marx and Lenin. Now, the Socialist Party had demanded his resignation when he supported Woodrow Wilson for president, a decision even Du Bois would come to regard as a mistake, after the racist Wilson restarted many segregationist and discriminatory policies in the federal government, 
And for the vast majority of his life, Du Bois' politics were far more pragmatic than ideological, but he was impressed with both the Soviet Union's poverty and its intensely committed revolutionaries. His political support, like the NAACP's support for different candidates, shifted back and forth between the Democrats and Republicans, as different candidates promised and failed to deliver on various reforms to fight lynchings, support voting rights, etc. In 1931, after the NAACP had failed to support the defense of the Scottsboro Boys, that's nine African Americans falsely accused of rape in Alabama, the Communist Party took up the case, and even Du Bois, who wrote several articles condemning that party, was impressed with the fundraising and publicity the partially successful effort generated. The Communist Party, in turn, condemned him as a class enemy, and the NAACP uh, as a liberal elite, totally disconnected from the working class black people they claimed to fight for. I don't know how true Du Bois thought that was, but I think such criticism probably weighed on his mind. In 1933, Du Bois became convinced that other leaders at the NAACP were coming for his job as editor of the crisis, and so he resigned and returned to Atlanta University that summer. In 1934, Du Bois suddenly reversed his insistence on integration and stated publicly that separate but equal facilities were acceptable to the black community. The NAACP begged him to retract his statement, and he refused. This would lead to Du Bois leaving the organization for 10 years. But while back at Atlanta during this time, he will produce Black Reconstruction, usually considered to be his greatest academic work. We will begin to dive into that in time, but just to finish up our brief biographical sketch, in 1936, he visited Germany, where he had studied during his Harvard stint. He also visited China and Japan. He was not blind to the Nazis' racial extremism, even as he expressed some ambivalence about German society, but Japan was far more successful in sort of pulling the wool over his eyes. Du Bois, for a time, viewed Imperial Japan as an antidote to Western imperialism in the Pacific, viewed their colonial rule in Manchuria as benevolent, and their alliance with Germany to be compelled by Anglosphere hostility, and American hostility to them both before and after Pearl Harbor to be motivated by racial animus. He was not wrong exactly about that last bit, but still, as President Biden might put it, because he can only communicate easily in monosyllables, oof. In 1943, at age 75, and as a result of his politics, probably especially regarding his opposition to involvement in World War II, he was abruptly fired from the Atlanta University. The faculty was outraged, and the university was shamed into providing him with a pension in the title of Professor Emeritus. When he turned down teaching offers at Fisk and Howard Universities to rejoin the NAACP as their director of special research, Du Bois surprised many not least the members of the NAACP itself, who were impressed by Du Bois' efforts there, despite their history together and his age. With the beginning of the Cold War came pressures for the NAACP to purge itself of communists or anything like a communist, and avoid any associations with him, pressures Du Bois ignored. Du Bois was not a communist yet, but a definite admirer of Marx and impressed by the legal racial equality of the Soviet Union. He called it the most hopeful country on earth. By mutual agreement in 1948, he resigned yet again from the NAACP. However, things were beginning to come to a head for him regarding Uncle Sam. The FBI had begun a file on him in 1942, which they appeared to have abandoned the next year when they couldn't actually get anything on him. But in 1949, their efforts resumed and the U.S. decided to take their shot in 1951, when the government alleged that the newly created Peace Information Center, an anti-nuclear weapons organization that Du Bois chaired, was an agent of a foreign state, and demanded its leaders register with the federal government. Du Bois and the others refused, and were indicted. The NAACP issued no statement of support, and did not employ its legal defense fund on his behalf. But many labor leaders and others who represented more working-class interests, dirty reds themselves, they were considered at the time, were more supportive. It appears he beat the government's rap before the jury had a chance to render a verdict. 
when Albert Einstein, who actually wrote an article for The Crisis Under Du Bois in the 1930s, offered to appear for him as a character witness, causing the judge to dismiss the case before he became involved. Despite Du Bois' victory, two things left him bitter about the experience above all others. The first was his disappointment at the NAACP and other friends, comrades, and colleagues who failed to support him during his trial, either materially or even morally. The second was that despite his lack of conviction, the government took his passport, keeping him from any international travel. In 1950, only 82 years young, he ran for governor of New York on the American Labor Party ticket, receiving about 4% of the vote. Now, David Lewis, probably the best biographer of Du Bois we have, considers Du Bois' embrace of communism as not for its own sake, but because its enemies were his enemies. In other words, I think he means, as the state, the United States that is, came to target and prosecute him despite his age, Du Bois came to view the United States as his enemy, and therefore the Soviets as his friends, and their ideology eventually became his when he joined the party incredibly late in his life. Now, I'm sure all this was a factor, but I suspect that Lewis is a liberal engaging in more than a little bit of excuse-making here that ultimately does Du Bois a disservice. Du Bois was clear long before the 1950s how he felt about socialism and communism, radical democratic control over the organization of labor and the means of production, and what kept him from an earlier embrace of the American white working class. At best, his encounters with Uncle Sam's Justice Department made him pitch a louder fit about joining the Communist Party and telling the public he would renounce his American citizenship, but Du Bois was far too self-conscious and intelligent to let himself be so crudely driven, I think, by personal experience. To conclude his life, in 1958, the government finally gave him his passport back, which meant that the newly created Republic of Ghana, born 1960, was pleased to begin hosting him. His visits there focused on his plans for an encyclopedia of the African diaspora called Encyclopedia Africana. And by 1961, he was there permanently. He would not be leaving nor would he ever complete his encyclopedia. Now, in his 90s, his health began to decline, and he died, as I described, on August 27th, 1963. Of all the nations with a diplomatic presence in the nation of Ghana at the time, only the United States of America failed to send any envoy whatsoever to his state funeral. So, Obviously, I have left out some of what I might have included and included things I might have left aside, but here we are, and his life laid before you, more or less. I have not spoken much about his works of letters, with a couple of exceptions. He was a gifted writer, as well as a good scholar, like I said. A rare combination, I think. And as I noted before, he wrote lots, and I have not read at all, obviously. His The Souls of Black Folk is good, as even the liberal Roy Wilkins recommended, and despite a few errors of fact, his biography of John Brown is also quite good, as is his 1915 book, The Negro. He also wrote three autobiographical works, which are all quite moving, Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil, 1920, Dusk of Dawn, an essay toward an autobiography of a race concept, 1940, and his last published posthumously in 1968, the autobiography of W.E. Burkhardt Du Bois, and much else I haven't mentioned. But for my money... If he'd never published anything except Black Reconstruction, he'd still deserve to be considered a first-class historian and political philosopher. So, what is Black Reconstruction? It's generally described as the story of Reconstruction in the United States, uh, but let's start with this. What is Reconstruction, anyway? I don't think this is a silly or a stupid question. Is this the story of reconstructing a nation? After Civil War, are we reconstructing states here on a strong federalist model with all the privileges and power of those states? Are we reconstructing society itself, what rights it guarantees to whom and how it organizes labor? And who exactly do we mean by we? There's probably more than one good answer to all these questions, but 
when Du Bois talks about Reconstruction, he's not really talking about the mere legal process by which the South was readmitted to the Union on equal terms in politics, but about reconstructing a basis for democracy in the South and the North, voters with rights. In truth, it is more construction than reconstruction. As before the war in the South, even among the white population, there were very few people who had sufficient property to be granted the franchise and therefore say in the public sphere. And personally, I take all this especially to heart as a white Southerner. This is not just the story of how democracy was expanded temporarily to include the newly freed black people of the South, but of how it was temporarily expanded to everyone, even my peasant farmer ancestors. There is more, however. Du Bois' essay also ably covers pre-war conditions in the North and the South and takes the time to analyze as classes the black slaves, poor whites, and planners of the South, their shifting attitudes towards the war, their interests, and their fates. In fact, some of my favorite stuff is found in these chapters, particularly details on how white Americans in different sections and classes saw slavery during and after the war, he explains the war, why and how it ended in defeat for the Confederacy, the attitude of early socialists and labor activists towards the situation, and the struggle of post-war governments to form radically different arrangements regarding the labor of the now free slaves. He details differences between states with different populations. In Louisiana, for example, where the racial caste system had always been far more complicated, and which had a small, somewhat educated and property black and mixed-race community, Reconstruction went very differently than it did in Mississippi, where there was none of these things, and where the war had hardly touched most of the big planners. As a work of literature, it is a shot against the historical consensus of the 1930s that Reconstruction was a failure, and it was a failure due to the unpreparedness of black people and their inferiority and their inability to govern themselves. Helped in their failure, of course, with northern plunderers and southern white traders hand in hand. But how far can Reconstruction be considered a failure? Who defeated the effort to construct democracy in the South? How and why did they defeat it? Through extensive and impressive scholarship in an age where research was much more difficult than today, Du Bois tells the story. His work was basically ignored for 30 years as the nation and its white historians continued to indulge a southern white fairy tale, and they had almost no interest in effectual chronicling of events that challenged white supremacy. But the myths Du Bois stood against, almost totally alone at the time, have lost much of their influence and potency but still haunt us, and forms both exact and diffuse. The truth is this, the struggle to define what freedom in the United States would look like for the former slave is a story of freedom in America for everyone, both in what it looks like and who gets it. For us small folk today, the result might leave a lot to be desired in our modern society. But the small people once had a revolution in our hands, I think. It is often said by educated types that it is the masses that threaten societies. Landless and virtueless plebs brought down the Roman Republic. Illiterate and heretical peasants leave kingdoms in lawless rebellion. And the slaves both cause the Civil War and nearly ruin the United States of America with their Reconstruction governments. But at least in the last case, it was in fact the slaves who saved the nation and showed the world for a brief shining moment what abstract notions like freedom and democracy could truly look like. Du Bois took the trouble to set it all down. I took the trouble to read it. So next episode, we will dive in properly from beginning to end into the radical democracy of Black Reconstruction. But before we go, I want to leave you with his words. This is Credo. First published way back 1904 by W. E. Burkhart Du Bois. I believe in God, who made of one blood all races that dwell on earth. I believe that all men, black and brown and white, are brothers, 
varying through time and opportunity in form and gift and feature, but offering in no essential particular and alike in soul and in the possibility of infinite development. Especially do I believe in the Negro race and the beauty of its genius, the sweetness of its soul and its strength in that meekness which shall yet inherit this turbulent earth. I believe in pride of race and lineage and selfish pride of self so deep as to scorn injustice to other selves and pride of lineage so great so as to despise no man's father and pride of race so chivalrous as to neither offer bastardy to the weak nor beg wedlock of the strong, knowing that men may be brothers in Christ even though they be not brothers in law. I believe in service, humble, reverent service, from the blackening of boots to the whitening of souls, for work is heaven, idleness hell, and wage is the well done of the master who summoned all them that labor and are heavy laden, making no distinction between the black sweating cotton hands of Georgia and the first families of Virginia since all distinction not based on deed is devilish and not divine. I believe in the devil and his angels who wantonly work to narrow the opportunity of struggling human beings, especially if they be black, who spit in the faces of the fallen, strike them that cannot strike again, believe the worst and work to prove it, hating the image which their maker stamped on a brother's soul, I believe in the Prince of Peace. I believe that war is murder. I believe that armies and navies are at bottom the tinsel and braggadocia of oppression and wrong. And I believe that the wicked conquest of weaker and darker nations, by nations whiter and stronger, but foreshadows the death of that strength. I believe in liberty for all men, the space to stretch their arms and their souls, the right to breathe and the right to vote, the freedom to choose their friends, enjoy the sunshine and ride on the railroads, uncursed by color, thinking, dreaming, working as they will in a kingdom of God and love. I believe in the training of children, black even as white, the leading out of little souls into the green pastures and beside the still waters, not for pelt or peace, but for life lit by some large vision of beauty and goodness and truth. Lest we forget, and the sons of the fathers like Esau for mere meat barter their birthright in a mighty nation. Finally, I believe in patience. Patience with the weakness of the weak and the strength of the strong, the prejudice of the ignorant and the ignorance of the blind. Patience with the tardy triumph of joy and the mad chastening of sorrow, patience with God. Thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed that. I always say that. I should be more original. I hope it leaves you hungry for more Black Reconstruction. I also hope you didn't mind the reading at the end. 500,000 people dead. Of course, I'm feeling more spiritual these days <laughs> folks don't forget patreon.com slash distant peasant how you support the show distantpeasant.com is the headquarters you can find links to paypal venmo the patreon the twitch channel the youtube channel all kinds of stuff there also, I want to remind you, if you are thirsty for more Jeff-included content, and you just don't want to wait for a new episode to be researched and written, twitch.tv slash postpostrevolution. Working hard to make that a real Twitch channel, a real show, a real cool community where we can talk about our dog shit, politics, in America. Again, that's twitch.tv slash postpostrevolution. Check it out. Give it a follow. Maybe a sub. Patreon.com slash peasant. I will see you next time.